Hello. So, uh, today I thought what I would do is uh, go over what I would call, uh, I don't know, my, my container strategy notebook. And what I mean by that is... So I, I've, I was thinking to do this because uh, I was getting in, involved. I was having some conversations with people where there was, uh, there was a lot of detailed uh, discussion about this product versus that product, build our own thing versus buy our thing. You know, typical thing you get in with a vendor. And, uh, you know, I was realizing that there wasn't a lot of discussion of like, well, why, why do we care about a container-based thing or a Kubernetes thing or a PaaS thing? And I wanted to, I was kind of working on like, how we in VMware Tanzu land would explain what we do or how I would explain what we do. And I realized that like, uh, there's a lot of front matter that hasn't gone into just kind of saying why you would do it. Because, you know, when you're deciding between some technology, it's good to have a, uh, you have some reasons to do it because you're gonna track the, you know, productivity and uh, if it's worth the time and money to spend on it. And uh, also, especially when it comes to something like Kubernetes, I find there's a lot of friction, a lot of weirdness that happens when you're talking with an operations group, an infrastructure group, and, uh, you know, they're discussing like, we need this kind of Kubernetes or this kind of way of running containers. And then, but they don't really know like what workloads, as they would say, or applications are running in it. They don't like know why it's just sort of like they're running that infrastructure. Uh, so anyhow, it got me sort of like thinking through like, how would one, uh, if you were kind of starting from zero, how would you uh, do your, your Kubernetes uh, and, well, more importantly, your, your container strategy, right? Because even like naming it at the beginning assumes a little too much. And then, of course, as I'll get to, you know, we in uh, VMware Tanzu land, we have a couple of options for your, your con uh, a few, I should say, a few options for your container-based way of doing stuff. If you want to do container-based applications, why would you want to? We'll get into it. Uh, there's a couple of options that we have that you can use, try out, hopefully fall in love with and uh, start becoming a, a, a customer of. So first of all, it's taken me a while to get this stuff together. I'm going to have a little snack first. It was my daughter's uh, birthday today. I mean, it still is. And my mother, who's been able to visit here, made uh, French toast. Now, I already ate a bunch of French toast this morning, which is not the healthiest thing to have. I mean, it really, I guess it's just bread with egg on it, unless you add a bunch of maple syrup, which which I like to do. But I have not done here. So I'm gonna save the second piece in reserve, but I'm gonna go ahead and use this maybe as a, uh, as a pointing device. You can see there's some exciting stuff going on in the background there too. But let me, uh, I've, I've loaded this all up onto the old, uh, the old iPad as a uh, nice controlled way of going over things. So first, let, well, let me switch over to that. I think what I'm going to uh, do, let me give you, it's always nice to have a little overview. Is this right? Yeah. You can't really see this, but first I want to go over like, let's establish like why we care. And there's two ways of doing this. I promised you I'd use my, my French toast here. But one of the things that I think is good to look at is like, is this even a concern? Why are people even doing this? And it's kind of difficult to track down with container-based things. And I've kind of used, uh, there's a lot of this is incomplete. Um, I didn't really track platform as a service stuff, things like uh, Cloud Foundry or the Tanzu application service as we call it now, uh, which I'm realizing I should have, but I'm just using Kubernetes as a container foil or a way of representing that. And then I wanted to go over, you know, I had a few pages on figuring out like why, what the, what benefits you get, what problems it solves, which I think, again, in the discussions I've been listening into or having recently about like the difficulty of doing a container based thing or the cost or whatever, like, it seems like people have lost track of like why we would be doing it, what problem is it solving, what benefits does it bring? Because if you don't know those things, it's hard to make any evaluation beyond just sort of like aesthetics and cost. And then, uh, you know, I'll go into just a little bit more, like tiny bit low level, and uh, and that's that's about it. So we'll start here. And 
Mm. I think I've given enough context already, so let's jump right into it. You know, let me see. Hmm. Oh, I know. We can zoom in. So, you know, Kubernetes has been around. I should uh, for a long time. Cloud Foundry has been around for a long time. Doing things in a container way has been around for a long time. So I think I wanted to check in on like, okay, should should uh, regular, in a good way, mainstream people at large enterprises be looking into this? Should they be interested in it? Are they interested in it? Right? And you can kind of track uh, first what I get. You know what I what what you always want to gather. What I always want to gather is of all of the workloads globally that exist, all the applications running in production, what percentage are running on containers versus not containers versus, I guess, running on VMs and bare metal and mainframes. And over the years, this has been pretty hard to track. And there's estimates, you know, people who do SaaS monitoring things will kind of count amongst their customer base what people have. You get this from Datadogs and other places. We do surveys on it. And the CNCF does surveys as well. And, and as well as analysts. And, you know, what I would really like to see for these surveys is I would like to see the past, like, 10 years of them. Not only to see trends, but to also kind of rate the accuracy of the predictions. Because, again, it's a very difficult thing to predict. And I would like to know, like, how how has that been going, right? Or have we been leveled off at, like, in three years, we're going to have 50% adoption for the past, you know, five years, which is usually the case with these kind of things. But anyways, so if we look at the CNCF's uh, uh, latest, which I think is 2020, I think the 2021 is still open, you can see a pretty good representation that... people are using containers. Now, whenever I'm looking at usage of a new technology, I'm interested in, in two things. One, are people using it? And then two, how much are they using it, right? And that's what this first chart shows. And you have to be very aware of these differences, right? Because using it, usually, sometimes it's specified, but it means that someone in this example is using at least perhaps only at most one container in their entire organization. Now, it usually means like uh, like a lot more. Uh, so you can kind of track the way that it's done here. As you can see, it's done for development, test, POC. And, you know, in theory, you can kind of see like as it moves through the chain, uh, like it would show up more and more. But Essentially, what you see here is that there is a lot of usage uh, of containers in pre-production. People, you know, just use it. It's easy to get a hold of them and use containers and do things like that. But when it comes to production, that's where the important thing is. That's where the ramp up, uh, where you see change, right? So this goes back to March uh, of 16, right? And so what's good here, and again, this doesn't tell you how many productions or how many apps, but that's fine. It, it does show that there's been a progression of obviously people not doing very much. And then there was this rapid jump. Now I would suspect that's just survey methodology because that is a huge jump to have between March and June <laughs> of containers in production. But if we more like look over time, you can see that it's gone up quite a bit, right? And so there are people running Kuber uh, containers, I keep saying that, but containers in production. So that starts to become an important thing uh, to, to pay attention to. I don't know who these 2% of people are who plan not to run containers, which, which is funny uh, or fun. So the next, I remember what we're doing here is we're doing, I mean, in my notebook form, we're doing the legwork to prove that we should care about doing Kubernetes stuff in the first place, right? So now here from the, the same survey, mm, I want to eat that second piece, but I'm going to hold off for now. Mm, or maybe I will. Maybe we'll take a little uh, French bread break. <coughs> Not French toast. <coughs> French toast. You know, I heard that... Uh, that what the French call it is lost bread. 
you know, it's it's old stale bread. Or maybe just day old, depending on your, your standards for bread. And, um, you know, you soak it in the eggs so it gets kind of gooey. I prefer gooey, gooey style, to, uh, to tell you the truth. I don't know if you need to be told the truth, but that is the truth. Uh, and uh, you soak it like that, and then that way it's uh, more delicious. And, you know, it's lost bread because you were just going to throw it out anyways, I, I guess. You know what I'm doing here is I'm promoting this in uh, Kden. So let's see. That's why I'm talking in this halting way. Uh-oh. Yep, now we're done. Because we got to get those eyeballs, right? You know you love them. I, I don't know what that means. So let's go. Let's go back. Uh, now that I've done some promotion there, did that post well? Oh, looks stunning. Not really. Uh, so, so here we are. Now we've got what I'm always interested in. Although it's presented in um, a kind of difficult to use easily way. So this shows you number of containers in production and let me see you can see why my mind doesn't work for this kind of thing it is showing you this is one of those things that the observability people are probably like oh that's a wonderful way to represent a graph because it tells you some percentile of your quartile upper 95th noise reduction finding the problem but i i'm not trained to understand graphs like this so i find it very confusing so this is saying the percentage of respondents who are running this amount of containers in production, right? So I think what that means is 19% of the respondents said they are running 5,000 or more containers in production. And then, you know, 25%, uh, oh, let me go back to my daily, 25% said that they're running 50 to 249 in production. Now, those are just sheer numbers. You would want to get a sense of how many containers are needed for an application. For example, if uh, if you are running a uh, uh, an airline booking application, I go in, I search around. I mean, the complete workflow, right? Uh, I go in and I search for. You can see some party planning going on there. Let's see. Uh, I go in and I search for a ticket. That's a certain set of services and things that could be running in containers. I select a ticket. It has to reserve that ticket. You got more containers involved. I say I want to buy the ticket. You got to uh, do some credit card processing or payment processing. You got to set aside that seat back to the inventory system, more containers. Uh, and then, um, I don't know, I pick, a, I select a seat, more containers spin up to do something, right? So it'd be interesting to know in a workflow like that, how many containers does that evolve? Then you could multiply that by how many times a day that's done. Uh, at an average airline, then you can multiply that by the total number of airlines and you could sort of start to get a sense of like how many containers are going on in that industry and multiply it out more and more, whatever. So I don't know if that's 5,000 containers. I don't even know the time, but whatever. What you get from here is that there are a fair amount of people running a, a containers in production, right? Like, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's plenty of them. So that's good. So we've established that people are running containers in production. So therefore, if you are an infrastructure person, if you're an operations person, you do need to start worrying about how it is your container strategy. How do we, how do we do that now? Just to like, it's good to have multiple sources for this since it's so early. Here's our 2020 state of Kubernetes survey. We came out with the 2021. I think I went over here somewhere. If you go to tanzutalk.com slash videos, you can find it. But here, I think it's a little more, a little less. Now, this has been broken out uh, differently, right? So here you can see, we didn't really list everything that that uh, that we did. There we go. Where's my little friend? So you can see that 20% of those have 50 or more clusters. So we're doing this by clusters instead of containers. And then, you know, at least running one Kubernetes thing in production there's 59% who said they've been doing it. And then you got some more stuff here. So these are also like require quite a bit of thinking to draw some conclusion beyond like, oh, people are running it in production. So we should, uh, we should uh, support them and worry about it. Now, 
Here's another angle. You can look up some Gartner press releases uh, if you don't have access to reports. And I've highlighted two things, more more looking at what's going on here. So they, they uh, estimate slash predict that today, and again, it's always good to know the dates. This is June 2020. So their estimate is that as of June 2020, or it might have been, uh, what's before June, April when they wrote this and it had to go through, you know, several weeks of press approval and things like that. Who knows exactly when the cutoff date is and the research might have been done months before that, whatever, let's say spring 2020, that that amount of precision doesn't matter. But they see that there's less than 30% of a global organization running uh containers in production. Now, I would take global organization to mean large enterprises probably weighted heavily towards not tech companies, right? So enterprises, kind of the Gartner uh, customer base. Now, their prediction is that two years from then, about one year from now, 75% will be running containers in production, which now the CNCF surveys includes technology companies. In fact, I think it's 40% of the, the survey base. Uh, and they have some breakouts maybe somewhere based on size. Uh, oh, here comes another. Yep. So you can see that when it comes to in 2022, 75% of organizations running in production, if we kind of, is the word cross check? If we compare that, you can see that basically the CNCF is kind of in those numbers, not only for global organizations, but all organizations as a whole. So that kind of squares that you would be running at least one container maybe even only one container in production. You've got penetration, right? So that number kind of checks out. Uh, You know, it's basically the large organizations lagging behind the small ones. Uh, In aggregate, there are many large organizations who are doing great things and are uh, doing things quickly. Now, here's like the the one, the good one, like the one that I always want to know, right? Like how many of these enterprise applications are running on uh, containers, right? Now, today, remember spring of 2020, Gartner estimates that in large enterprises, there's only 5% of applications running on containers, right? Which is small uh, compared to like all the attention that things get, but that's fine. And you can see there's actually a pretty good growth. Now, for some reason they do 2024 instead of 2022 probably because it's a more impressive number. I used to put together stuff like this. You kind of like bounce around and what's good. So that will be 15% of the workloads or the apps they estimate will be there. Now, in 2024, who knows? Maybe it'll still be 50% four years out or 20%. It's kind of irrelevant. But this, I think, ultimately is one of the most important things to pay attention to. Let's just assume it has enough accuracy. Basically, what it's saying is like, All right, if you're in charge of selecting a container strategy, this is a great time to do it because by the time you get to 10%, this is going to be a big headache, right? It's going to be a lot of the focus that you have if you don't have it sorted out. You're going to be under pressure to put something in place in less than a year when you ramp up to 12% then 15%, right? You're not going to have a lot of time to do work to select what's going on. Whereas now, not only do you have time, you probably have like one or two years to kind of sort through it before it becomes a big problem. Uh, and, but you also have some amount of workloads of apps that are actually running in production that you can learn from, right? So this is the great time to be figuring out what your, uh, your container strategy is. Uh, so that's our first part. Let me take a little French bread break here. This one could have been battered in eggs a little bit more, but it's still fine. Mm. Delicious. So again, What we're trying to do here is establish the urgency and then the context of of going through this decision, right? Because you're going to go to a lot of meetings, you're going to have a lot of conversations and you need to like figure out like, is it justified versus other priorities that I have? Like, I don't know, maybe it's more important for you to spend your time moving off of mainframes or just regardless of container stuff, worrying about something else. Again, I kind of made the case that it should be on your priority list, but whatever. So speaking of, you know, I made some coffee for myself. So uh, let me have, have some of that. I didn't get much sleep last night because it was uh, on Thursday nights. 
uh, we record, well, Thursday night my time, but on Thursdays, we record the Software Defined Talk podcast, my old, my own podcast. And I usually end up staying up till 1 a.m. because we start at like 10.30 and, you know, it goes on a while. We, I, th- last night was my draft of discussing all of this stuff. So if you go to softwaredefinedtalk.com and find the episode for September 10th, of 2021, you can see me kind of like rambling through this a lot more uh, hand wavy style than I am here, which is still very hand wavy style. Hand wavy, of course, a term coined by James Governor at Red Monk, who I think was the uh, original practitioner of uh, of that technique. So let me do a little audio check. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so here we're going to jump into the whys, like why we, you know, let's, it's important to pay attention to the goals we have, the benefits we're hoping to achieve, and why containers help you achieve those things, right? Because this is, this is what I think, if you're not thinking about and aware of these all throughout putting together your container strategy, and then ongoing when you're maintaining it and thinking about how you prioritize it, you're going to really lose track and you're going to start just focusing on cost and like coolness, the two C's, you know, avoid focusing on just cost and coolness, which is fun at a good price, but it's, it doesn't always help you achieve the the goals that you have. So now, why do we even care about using containers, right? Why don't we just improve the way we're currently doing things? And I think in that episode last night, my uh, my friend Matt Ray, he added some additional stuff here. Uh, and to summarize it, it's just that technologically with uh, existing ways of doing things, you can't really support, uh, you know, what, what you need to do. So basically, the first thing that I like to go over is that more or less. And there are some ISVs who are doing software currently that package software, off the shelf software that you could buy that will run on Kubernetes. I actually just encountered some of that this morning. So you might just need to run Kubernetes just to support ISV software that you're running, which which is fine. But I don't really care about that so much. That's of a secondary concern. The primary concern, and I think the thing you should focus on the most is we are writing our own software our custom written software that helps run our business, whatever it may be, internal facing or external facing. And we are not able to do that software, to evolve that software uh, as much as we would like, as quickly as we would like, or at all, in the case of many legacy problems. And also, uh, maybe it doesn't like the performance of it. It's not reliable, it's slow, like that part also doesn't work. So we need to change the way that we're doing software. And that's where you start to get to containers, right? So, but let's start with like what I would call the business drivers. Now, I don't know, I shouldn't go off on like business and business value, but it's like why the point of doing the software. So the first one, and this is a bit of your digital transformation rehash, but you're a motivator is that you want to use, oh, I don't wanna erase. You wanna use software as the core way of doing business innovation, right? The way that you evolve and you improve your business. You're gonna do by adding and modifying features in your software, right? That's gonna directly affect how your business runs. And you see that, uh, I don't know, I always go over examples of that, but you are starting to program the business. Now, the next thing is not only an initial cut at that, but you want your business and therefore your software to have a lot of agility and flexibility. You wanna be able to try new things frequently, change things around. We saw this, especially, you know, with COVID stuff where organizations had to support remote working, grocery stores had to do delivery. Uh, you would need to have a brand new type of, of loan approval as uh, loans were given out by governments, all sorts of adaptation that you had to do rapidly. Now, people were forced to do that, but just being able to do that in the normal course of things, especially if you're competing, is extremely valuable for a business and software can do that, right? If you're doing software well and software has that agility. And part of that, not only changing what you're doing, but being able to do it rapidly, which is time to market, right? Which is to say you have an idea of a feature, you're gonna do it in your software, it's gonna change how you run your business and you wanna be able to do that as quick as possible. You know, maybe in days, 
hopefully just a week, but definitely not longer than three, six months, right? Like that's a long time uh, to have time to market. And when you're at a year, and if you remember from some other surveys, there's a lot of people who have said that uh, they haven't deployed a software release in a year or more, uh, which means their business essentially has been missing out on a way to evolve and get better for uh, the past 12 months. So shortening time to market is another reason to use containers. It's, it will provide that for you. And then also, you know, as a vendor who's selling stuff, you struggle to ever make yourself say you want to control costs or lower costs, uh, because that means that's less that we, the vendors can charge for you. So that's why we never talk. Well, we try to never talk about reducing costs unless we're happy with our costs and our competitors are more. Uh, but you know, we, uh, we want to make money. We need to make money, right? Like, uh, that's the business side of what software vendors do. So. I reworded that as appropriate ROI, which is to say, when you're spending money on this stuff, you can't spend more money than you're bringing in with the exceptions of, you know, if you're, uh, if you're starting off a new business and you think that like it's worth investing a lot into it, so you're gonna be running at a loss because eventually you will be running at a profit or uh, it's one of these, you know, you're, it's a last stand or competing against robot dogs where like, the alternative to going into debt is going bankrupt, then you can do that, that's for sure. Uh, you know, and also, you know, this is uh, one of my favorite snarky things about lots of tech companies and startups is they may sort of be planning for like five years out profitability, but usually what they're planning their strategy around is having a high valuation, showing high growth, and they're gonna sell to someone or have some sort of exit event where the original people doing this their goal was to sort of like extract that value uh, from a highly valued company. And, you know, it may not always be this directly cynical, but they're looking to pass uh, the problem of becoming profitable on to the future. These are all exceptions to having appropriate ROI. Now, that said, most of the people in these situations also don't want to spend a lot of money and they want to make sure the money they spent is, uh, is spent wisely. So that's, uh, you know, these I think are the criteria really of any kind of shift in, in software that you're doing, not any, sometimes you just have to for like security, it's like you do it because it's secure, not because you have business flexibility necessarily. But especially when we're in the context of thinking about why you would use containers and something to keep in mind ongoing as you're making decisions about it and kind of going through life and struggling with all those meetings and uh, selecting which container technology you're going to be using. You want to keep those involved in mind of like, is the decision that I'm making right now, is it going to contribute to that? Like, does it, does it like matter? Uh, or, or am I kind of getting lost and distracted now, as I say, the capability to change and improve your business without it costing too much or being late. That's what you want. Now, I, I think <laughs> in a funny way, you see me laughing, ho, ho. If uh, you should look up the iron triangle, and that's basically what I've outlined here is that you want to achieve the iron triangle and uh, people who are beaten by the iron triangle, uh, they like to tell you that it's uh, it's it's bad. It doesn't exist. People who want the iron triangle do want it to exist and they don't really bemoan that it's impossible to deliver on quality, budget and schedule. I don't know. Maybe we should aspire to the iron triangle, even if we can't uh, achieve it. Just don't overpromise. So let's look at the technical drivers. And I don't really go in, this is a, a hole in my analysis is what I would really like to have here. And this is a little bit of what Matt Ray went over in that software defined talk episode with me last night. Uh, it would be nice to actually have kind of like a side by side technical thing of like with containers, it's possible and faster to scale to meet demand, right? Or with containers, it's better than the alternative to do whatever technical thing, like just a straight up in the same way that you would say, like, you know, with a newer uh, computer, it runs faster, right? Like it'd be nice to have those kind of benchmarks for containers versus I guess VMs, I, I don't know, or bare metal or, you know, running whatever. And that's something I don't have an analysis for that I think would also be good in, in your kind of notebook for figuring out your container strategy. However, these are more like, the technical benefits that you're looking to achieve with containers. So, or the benefits, but like the technical reasons. Now, one of them might be that if you're starting a new app uh, that doesn't exist already, it's just like 
I, this is kind of against the way I try to judge things, but like containers are just the way that you write apps nowadays. It's become kind of the default architecture and more than like, it's pretty easy, uh, especially if you're doing like a 12 factor application, as you can see, it kind of begs the question why, but you're going to get a lot of benefits. It's just a, uh, you know, it's just the incremental improvement to how we do applications, how we design and architect them and run them. So if you're doing a new application, chances are very high, it should be container based, right? Now, if we go back, right, that is going to be a very small percentage of apps, right? Most of the applications out there are existing, not new applications. So, you know, even these 5%, this might be new applications. Uh, they probably are all net new applications, most of them, 4.8% of that 5%. And that's why it's so small is large organizations, or I'm sorry, global organizations. Uh, they don't really write that many new applications. They more run on their existing applications. Anyhow, so if you're writing a new one, good opportunity, good reason, uh, driver to use containers. Now, another reason to use containers and is that it's a lot easier to do a lot of what I would call product management ways of thinking, right? So if you're deploying on a weekly, if not daily basis, you want to test out multiple ways of doing the features. You want to do A-B testing. Is it better to have this workflow have three steps? or four steps? Like, is this drop down list of selecting uh, the type of insurance you want? Like, I don't know, how, the way we pre-populate it, does it work better this way or that way? Like, whatever. So doing things in a container based way, largely based on it being stateless 12 factor apps, blah, blah, blah. Like doing this kind of testing is really easy, right? And then also, if you're doing a lot of API thing, uh, um, there's all sorts of words for this now. I think, I think we're very fast coming to the point where microservice, APIs and serverless are all kind of coagulating into this mean kind of the same thing. But if what you, the way you want your applications to work is that we used to call these mashups, I think, but you want to integrate together a whole lot of different services, your own third-party services, things like that, then there's a good chance that doing things in a container-based way will be better because that's a container-based architecture is built around this concept of being a distributed application and using multiple sources. And then uh, also just if you're deploying your software frequently, right, daily, if not weekly, again, the way that container-based applications are architected, the way that um, they externalize, the way, the way that they're not monolithic, basically. Uh, a lot of work goes into removing the dependencies on third party from your application's perspective on other services so that your part of the application can deploy on its own and move at its own speed rather than having to go in lockstep and then be on like a, you know, three, six months release train because you have all these dependencies to other things. I mean, that's a huge part of what a container based application is. So if you want to have that kind of speed, doing things in a container based way is extremely helpful. Now. Like I said, this is the part that us vendors, we, we don't like to talk about because we want to sell our, we want your costs to be as high as possible, uh, as high as sustainably possible, because we get that a large part of that money. That's kind of a cynical way of looking at it. But like, I don't know when you're selling something, you likely want the highest price as well, such as the way that business works. But another driver that I hear all the time is that containers seem to drive a lower cost. Now, a lot of this can, did I write this down here? A lot of this can come from mainframes, right? That there are things that it, if you do the case, right? Sometimes the business case is that it doesn't make sense to move it, right? Like there may be non-monetary reasons to move it, whatever those may be. Uh, moving it from traditional VM-based things, moving it from physical or moving it even from a cloud-based way of doing things. Uh, it might make more sense to run it in a, in a container, right? Like whatever it may be, the chances are that that, uh, that putting th your applications in a container-based way, at least in the medium to long run, will be cheaper. If only when you get to using things like uh, like Knative, the cloud native runtime we call it in Tanzu land, uh, because you're able to once you architect your applications in a container way, you can scale down to zero, so you can control those costs there. Now. As comes up per every year, you, managing your data ingress and egress, that is all of that data that you're using, that's sort of a hidden cost uh, that you have to deal with that containers really have nothing to say about that. <laughs> they, they, they're not, that's a whole other realm to, uh, to pay attention to. Now, 
the other area which which would motivate you to care about containers is for lack of a better phrase i would call operational excellence and this comes again from and this is one of the discussion one of the points that matt ray went over really well and that we talk about all the time over in tanzu land and that is i think i think is the too often forgotten like heart of kubernetes what what the entire point of kubernetes is is that you want to have uh the the best practices of how to architect your infrastructure and how to architect your applications and architect the way all of your services and applications work together and to a fault is the wrong word but to the fault of most people's understanding and struggling with Kubernetes. Um, and also uh, other platforms like uh, Cloud Foundry, right? Um, and Cloud Foundry has a different take, which makes this more explicit. But um, <laughs> my daughter has been discovered the rocking horse and uh, she is, goes crazy on it. Like it always looks like she's about to throw herself off of it. But I think she's pretty successful at it. She really loves, she can crawl up in there on her own and uh, rock around. Anyhow, um, what, what Kubernetes and other container orchestrators are trying to do is to impose an architecture and reduce the amount of things in that. So there's generally one way to get compute resources. There's generally one way to package up your applications. There's generally one way to set up and configure networking between those. There's generally one way on and on and on versus uh, the opposite approach of that is to have a, some infrastructure where there are not only multiple components, like multiple types of networking, multiple firewalls to deal with, but there are multiple ways to configure how applications run on that, right? You don't have just one way of doing it. And so a lot of what container court, uh, platforms are trying to do is to say like, no, 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 there's one way. like you have variability and choice in how in some of these things here but we're making we're reducing variability by standardizing on what infrastructure looks like and so that once you do that once you remove variability and also once you decide to use these very well thought out uh components right that for example we see in kubernetes and if you were to look into things like cloud foundry there's also very very thoughtfully put together uh components if you will um well, one, you're using good tools that a lot of thinking has gone into and a lot of road testing, you know, based on, on uh, you know, Google Think originally and then now spread, if, especially if you look at the uh, people who have used Cloud Foundry and the Tanzu application service, there's like five or seven years of people kind of testing out these things and it getting refined. So you can learn from the overall community and overall usage of the past 10 or 15 years of this is what the best in class infrastructure looks like. And then from that, that allows you to do better deploys and configuration to bring down your deployment error rate, you know, to use an SRE metric, the errors that happen with deployment to troubleshoot things better, right? You've just got, you've just got a better system there. Um, now, arguably in 10 years, we'll come up with something new and container stuff will be worse than that. We'll forget how great it was. Again, it's just incremental improvement over and over again, but a lot of the best of breed stuff and best practices are being put into containers. So there we go. And obviously, especially on that last one, you know, the technical ones, there's more detail and you can say like, you know, but this footnote and that footnote and comparing between different things, but those are the kind of goals, the reasons that you should have, right? And so if we look at the business ones and the technical ones, I mean, I would almost emphasize every time you sit down for a meeting and you're going to make a decision, just go over these to make sure you remember why you're doing them, what the point is, so you don't get distracted and try to relate them back to these things. And I'm sure there's more I've left off, but have an idea of the, the benefits that you were chasing in the first place. So then let me take another French toast break here. This is the first one that I went over. And mm, mm. That's real good. So, uh, <clears throat> mm, hold on. Still very good. Delicious. So, 
uh, I should probably eat lunch before I do these things. <clears throat> so here, here's what I want to do now. What, what I had started off doing is, uh, let me see. I need to go check on something and then we'll come to the exciting conclusion. Just a moment. Let me, uh, where is the, uh, on hold music? Now I spread it on here. And after I'm going to spread this on it, I'm going to lick the knife off. I don't know if it'll be good, but let's see. I'm going to eat it right now. That's really good. some cabinets put into the kitchen you know move to a new place here There's not really much in the in the kitchen we didn't like the design there so we're putting cabinets in and there was some some height decisions we got cabinets go all the way up to the ceiling which would be wonderful just to have maximum space i think it'll look great uh but you know you got to decide the the uh the lowest one conserving sort of depth when you're doing work and the height and considering picking stuff so uh, I wanted to give some input on there. We're going to go with the lowest possible setting to make it uh, easiest to uh, to work with, which I think will be fine. I think it'll it'll work out well. All right. So here, what we have is okay. Now I wanted to get to like the the kind of some technical selection, and let me just give you a spoiler. We have uh, we've got basically like three types of options here in VMware Tanzu, right? So if you, if you look, uh, let me, let me give you the, as direct a sales pitches as, as I can. 
uh, allow myself to do. If you uh, if you want to put a container strategy in place, right? All the reasons I just went over, I won't go over it again because you've already seen it. It's how, how long we've been going. You've, there's been an hour of saying why you would want to do that. Uh, we have three things to choose from, probably multiple ones, but there's actually kind of sort of another thing I'm I'm leaving off here. But let me let me include in this is we have all sorts of we have several levels of uh, of of Kubernetes distros that you can get right? From very uh, basic, I think we call it, standard to uh, advanced. And also there's the ability to just run Kubernetes in existing vSphere as well, or VCF. I, I kind of lose track of like the exact stuff that you need, but in your VMware estate, you can also just turn on uh, running Kubernetes in there, um, which I think is great, right? Because everyone has VMware. So if you want to start figuring out and learning VMware, you know, you can just talk to your VMware friends and probably turn that on and uh, just start to figure it out. Now, the next thing that we have, which I mentioned already, is the Tanzu application service. Uh, and this, it, it, what this is, is a full on platform as a service. It doesn't really want you to be concerned with how it's running the containers and orchestrating them. It doesn't actually uh, run on Kubernetes because it's existed for a long, long time before Kubernetes was capable uh, of doing it. And it's used by, I don't know what our customer account is, but uh, there are many, many containers in production uh, for several years, for many years now. Uh, you know, And when I go over the case studies and the astounding results that I have, many, maybe even all of them are based on people running on top of uh, the Tanzu application service, the former Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So if you want containers and the benefits of containers, all those things I just went over, that's another option. And I'll go over like a little bit of that. And then the third option is kind of a hybrid of those. And it's it's in beta now. We just announced it last week at Spring One Platform. And it's the uh, the uh, Tanzu application platform or TAP. Uh, and what, what that is, is instead of having just bare bones Kubernetes, right? Like just bare bones in a good way, but that, that level of infrastructure. And then instead of having a fully finished uh, predefined platform as a service, the, the thing that you would have to, for your container strategy. It instead has all of the various parts that you can combine together and use as one whole, as one platform. But you can also go and pick and choose those parts for usage as you need uh, to kind of build your own uh, container-based thing, right? So historically, I mean, if you know the history of, uh, of, of my, my part of the world of Pivotal, right, we only had one of those options. Uh, and so it was kind of a take it or leave it sort of thing. But I think what's happened is we found, uh, and um, there were many people who just wanted the full on platform as a service. There's still many people who benefit from that. You know, I, I was just earlier this week, there's someone new who's been, been using that. And so, but then there are also people who want to build their own thing, right? And uh, I think, when it comes to building your own, you've kind of just been left on your own. There's not that many like piece parts that you can go get out there that have, uh, you know, you got to go find stuff on your own and integrate it. Whereas what we're starting to do with the, uh, with the tons of application platform and also the Kubernetes distros is uh, integrate together and make sure all the parts, if you want to build your own thing, that at least there's a default to start with. Uh, people like that batteries analogy, which, which I, I don't like so I don't use it, but you can insert that one in, uh, if, if you enjoy it, but it's just, uh, it's just one of those ready-made meals to eat. Things can be chopped up for you. You could add more, or you could just order the meal as a whole and deploy containers to it pre-cooked. We need one of those diagrams like the old, uh, the old pizza one. So this is a bit of a, you can see this is actually the first thing that I worked on, right? Like I wanted to establish what's the demand, right? Like why, why would you care about it? And then we went over this, right? Uh, the kind of like showing that there's momentum for it. And then, okay. So I kind of already started going over this, which is here's the first decision that you're going to be making, right? Are you going to be building your container platform or are you just going to get one right now? If you just want to get one, uh, that goes to using a, uh, a pass, right? Now, I'm sure there's platforms as a service that don't use containers. They must exist, but basically I would I would like to rethink of platform as a service of as a fully finished out container platform 
like a container platform that's ready to use that adds in all of the features that you need that immediately can be used by developers. Operations people don't have to make a lot of decisions and experiment with things. Developers don't have to make decisions and experiment with things. You just get it up and running and you can start doing your, you can, your container strategy is done, right? Now, you aren't gonna be able to configure a lot of things and customize it uh, and you know things like that, but that is the point of using a platform as a service is that it has made all those decisions for you. And when it comes to something like the Tanzu application service, there's, you know, five, seven years of figuring out what works, integrating it together, and all of the, uh, you know, the kind of community of usage and the knowledge that all of the, the customers I always talk about are, right? So that's how you should think about platform as a service is it will do your container strategy, get you all these, these benefits and goals that we've been talking about. And uh, you don't really have to think about putting things in place, but it does constrain your choices, right? Like all those benefits come because you don't spend the time to think about it. You don't spend the time to maintain it. You don't spend the time to integrate these things together, so forth and so on. So, like I said, it's turnkey, less decision-making. It's like much, much more focused on those business outcomes and the developer outcomes than, the focus is the wrong word, but like, those are the drivers for picking it. If you don't want to, you know, if you're an operations person and you want to like mess around with things more and kind of get into the engine below what, as James Water calls it, the value line, uh, then it doesn't really, that conversation doesn't exist, right? So it's purely focused on delivering this, uh, which many people like, maybe you don't. And then of course there are, you know, there's these people now, this is a, just a, a kind of a, a proof anecdote is, um, you know, I've, I've been hearing in recent years that people have been using the Tanzu application service sometimes in their, org their organization. And this is another motivation for why I wanted to go over, like, let's focus on the whys of you're doing this stuff, right? Like always focus on what your end goal is rather than just, uh, you know, cost and coolness, right? So I've been hearing uh, from a lot of large organizations that have the, ton not a lot, but some large organizations that use the Tanzu application service, that now the operations people are trying to satisfy their container strategy by rebuilding the platform that they had uh, and building it on top of Kubernetes, right? Or other things. And the reaction that, that I hear from people who, the developers who are currently using uh, a PaaS, like the Tanzu application service, is that they don't want that, right? Like they're perfectly fine. Things are going well. They're achieving like these things and they don't want to switch over to doing that. So that's another thing to consider is like, do we already have an existing thing that is working? And if it delivers on these end goals, then, you know, maybe we shouldn't convert from it. Now that said, there, there, you know, uh, we, we do have a lot of customers, but it's not like we sell to everyone. We sell the Tanzu application service to everyone. So there are people who, you know, they want to start building things on their own. And for whatever reason, they might want to build up their platform. They might want to customize it. So in that case, uh, you know, if you look at uh, what we have, as I went over with the various Kubernetes distributions that we have, you can not worry about like pulling together Kubernetes on its own. And if you look at what we have in the Tanzu application platform, you know, you can start to layer that stuff in. And I think what's important is, again, as, as I kind of have gone over this, but make sure to always, when you're working on this, pay attention to the goals you're trying to achieve, right? Like to the reason that you're doing it. And more than the reason, you know, this is probably going to drive you, it's going to make your decision making easier because you'll be able to say like, does it help us with this goal? Is, does it have uh, what did I call it? Does it have appropriate ROI? Uh, and uh, you know, does it fit with what we want and does it actually work? Right. And so I was just earlier this week over at, uh, over at, and our, there's a bunch of recordings from spring one uh, that happened last week. There's a good talk about Albertsons an American grocery store chain. Um, using building a kubernetes based container um platform a strategy thing to support their edge stuff and for them you know edge is sort of like their compute in stores uh and in warehouses and things like that so it's a good overview of how a company thought through these kind of motivations like what they needed and how that mapped to using um you know uh, some kubernetes in the tanzu portfolio so it's definitely uh worth checking out so that's that's how I would uh, you know think through 
what what you're doing with your uh, uh, your container strategy, why you would you would want it, and really like starting to get a handle on like okay, does it make more sense for us to just have a ready-made container platform, a platform as a service, if you will, or should we do we instead have needs where we want to build up our platform, right? We want to build our own container platform, in which case we're probably going to start with Kubernetes. In which case, it's probably a good idea to find a distro, right? Like that we have uh, in the in the Tanzu portfolio, because part of what you're going to need to do is not only have Kubernetes itself, but you need all the integrations with existing compute stuff, right? Like you probably want to run it on on uh, your existing VMware stuff, or not on some infrastructure that you have. You need some way of securing your networking. You're going to need the service mesh stuff. You need to hook it up as you go up the stack to things like you know API gateways and. Uh, making sure you've got your um, your serverless stuff in there with something like Knative, all of these things that as you sort to start to build your own Kubernetes stack, you realize isn't sort of just like, as one of my bosses used to joke, on the CD-ROM that you use to install Kubernetes, but it's the additional stuff that you need to start integrating together, and that's that's the the other side, uh, the other path to production that we have in Tanzu land is helping you with all those parts so you can build it up or you can have a, a fully ready pre-built one depending on what uh, what needs you have between the two of them so with that here's here's you know i went i was searching around for um you know some of the research and i came across of all places uh you know it, it, it you know believe it or not it's just coincidental that i came across this but this is several years old, but there's uh, VMware put out this book that I haven't read all of. I just read the first like eighth or so because it covered the business drivers and reasons for doing Kubernetes that I wanted. And it looks like there's some fine detail, technical stuff at the end. But if you go look this book up, a lot of my thinking uh, was kicked off by and even kind of pulls from the discussion of the benefits of using uh, containers, why you would care about it and kind of that that why that I was going over there. Now, also, uh, there's going to be a lot more discussion of like these new ways of operating. And there's a lot of good talks that I've helped curate for our, our upcoming conference DevOps loop. There's a couple of the speakers that I was um, telling them the kind of talks that, that we wanted, and I'll be frank, that I want to hear, which directly explain why something like containers or Kubernetes or uh, GitOps, like all these kind of things in this cloud native world, directly explain why it makes the, the goals of DevOps better, right? Like I want to know what it is about these technologies that didn't exist already that improves things incrementally and makes things better. Because again, you know, otherwise, if you don't have that question, you always end up just talking about cost and coolness, which is a very small part of like caring about a technology. But it's coming up October uh, 4th, if I remember, and it's totally free. It's online, so it's really easy to attend. It's got a great lineup, uh, but if you go to devopsloop.io, you should register for it and uh, tune into it. It'll be, uh, it'll be really good stuff. I have a small talk there, but it's got a great mix of all this stuff. And then finally, I've mentioned it many, many times, but if you're interested in all of those, uh, those products from the app, all the T's, Taz, Tap, Tanzu, Kubernetes Advanced, like all those things, you can go to uh, tanzu.vmware.com. You see right there, tanzu.vmware.com. And you can look through all of that stuff. There's all sorts of videos. We've got lots of great tech documentation. But that's if you're really looking to build out your container uh, strategy, uh, that's a good place to start. We've got how, where, whatever angle you want to start with. I would just start by looking at the products and seeing what they do. Uh, but we've got also you can see what our customers are up to and how we uh, we can help you out and have been helping people build their uh, their container stack. So that's it for today. Not too long, especially when I added out the uh, the cabinet thing there. Um, you know, if you're interested in the archives, there's a lot of videos that are much shorter than this one, uh, but you can go to tanzutalk.com and click on the videos link. You can see a playlist of all the Tanzu Talk things, small ones, interviews, things like that. There's also a podcast there if you just go to tanzutalk.com. Um, I probably won't put this in the podcast because it's visual enough um, that it would be kind of weird. Uh, but you can also subscribe to a podcast, which are mostly interviews and other things. There's a great one in there. Um, I think the most recent one where we talk with 
one of the, the, the people who put together our application modernization practice, and they go over this idea called Swift and a few other things. And it, it, you know, if you enjoyed, if you see the value that I, in kind of like focusing on the whys and the business stuff, it's a, an even better approach to figuring out how you do legacy modernization, how you rewrite and refactor your code, even at that level, uh, purely, maybe not purely, but majority, mostly from a, a business perspective. And I think taking that view, as you, you'll hear in that interview of why you would do something like this, I mean, why filtering things by business, if you imagine there's a filter and it's like filter by business value, I think adds a lot of clarity and speeds things up uh, a lot more than if you don't take that into uh, close consideration. Well, so with that, I'll hopefully be back uh, next week on Tuesday. You know, I was a day late uh, today, but uh, I'll see y'all on Tuesday morning or so. Uh, and remember, uh, go to devopsloop.io and uh, you can register for that conference for free. Just sign up for it and uh, go to tanzu.vmware.com. And uh, we've, got, we've got the solutions for all the things uh, that I talked about here. Bye-bye.